Some say America got a reprieve from God from the previous sin agenda. If that is true, what is the responsibility of the Christian now? Democrats were hacking into the Republicans' server to get information at the end of the campaign, and then we know that information was then released into the public from a surveillance. This is unbelievable what happened. It is like a thousand times worse than anything that happened in Watergate. And yet, the complicit media is yeah. so in bed with That's Obama and Jared to. that it doesn't matter that a sitting president of the United States and the administration surveilled the presidential candidate on the other side of the aisle. Most people don't even know what happened. This is Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Today, Jan continues a series she started last week on what's happening now in our nation's capital. If you missed the first part of the series, it's on our website in the radio archives. A little later in this broadcast, we'll tell you how you can get both parts of the series on compact disc. Returning this hour from last week's program, former U.S. Representative Michelle Bachman and former Department of Homeland Security official Philip Haney. The information you'll hear today is a continuation from the discussion in Part 1, which aired last week. Let's begin with Part 2 of our series. Here's Jan Marco. And welcome to the program. I am so glad you could join me today as we're doing Part 2 of a two-part series with my in-studio guest, former representative from Minnesota's 6th District, Michelle Bachman, and author, commentator, and just all-around extremely interesting guy, Phil Haney. We'll say more about his uh, book a little bit later. And Michelle and Phil, last week we we covered some really interesting things from the shadow government to organizing for action, the fact that Barack Obama is not going away. He's two miles down the street from the White House. He's continuing to do as much, I'm going to use the word damage, as possible. And Michelle, you've been in politics a while. Ever seen anything like that? No, Mm -hmm. I mean, here his number one senior advisor for eight years, Valerie Jarrett, who had been joined to the hip with him since his days in Chicago as a community organizer. It was announced that she moved into the Obama's home, which is the headquarters, essentially, for this organizing for action in America. So clearly have not stepped back like most presidents do. They take a little time off. They write their book. We have found out that the Obamas are getting $65 million Million. for the books that they plan to write. But more importantly, they plan to continue without skipping a beat their agenda of radically transforming the United States. We need to recognize that they have a strategy, but we need to have a strategy too. And our strategy is to live in the light of the gospel and to radically transform this country and the world toward the gospel with the freeing, liberating power of Jesus Christ. Amen. We were talking a little bit off air, and Phil Haney, and and you have such, both of you have such interesting stories, but you've been in, you were originally part of the first Department of Homeland Security, and apparently people wanted to make you an example. And just Talk to us just for a minute or two about that, because they tried to block everything. You, they did block everything you tried to expose by way of Homeland Security. Not everyone knows your book. Well, the first time I became aware of uh, there was an emerging problem was in early 2006. I had written an article, open source article, called Green Tide Rising, Hamas Ascends, Mm -hmm. posted it on the front page magazine. And it wasn't long afterwards I got a call from what we call an internal affairs collateral duty officer up in Newark, New Jersey, who was going to come down and interview me because I was accused of unethical use Mm -hmm. of classified information in writing this article on Hamas. Well, let's stop right there. I was a sworn federal law enforcement officer with this expertise in uh, strategy and tactics of the global Islamic movement, well-known in counterterrorism, interviewing terrorists. And I'm told that I'm going to be investigated for writing an open source article about a globally designated terrorist organization called Hamas. And it happened. He came down. He interviewed everybody in what we call the horizontal chain and my entire upward chain of command. After 11 months, I was exonerated of no wrongdoing. But this was in 2006. And being an optimistic kind of person, I thought, well, I guess that 
that's over and done with, and we'll just keep going on. Little did I know that that was only the beginning. Mm -hmm. I ended up being investigated by my own administration, my own government, my own agency, eight more times during the course of my mm -hmm. career, and culminated my career under investigation from three simultaneous branches of the government, the Department of Justice, Customs and Border Protection, and Department of Homeland Security. And it wasn't for a moral lapse or a failure to obey a command or abrogation of duty. It was for putting information into the system that the Obama administration considered a violation mm -hmm. of the Privacy Act of Foreign Nationals and or, I should say, the privacy rights of foreign nationals and or a violation of their civil rights and civil liberties. Do you think, now, first of all, we can say radical Islam now, at least some in high leadership are saying radical Islam. Do you think that the FBI manuals, training manuals and everything will eventually go go back to telling the truth since that was blocked for so many years? Of course, that's our hope. And let me tell you how bad it actually got. Mm -hmm. The official FBI training manual says on the second page of paragraph two, I think it was around 2012, that just because an individual is affiliated with a known terrorist organization, we're not allowed to assume that that person may be a terrorist himself. Now, how do cops do with their job when you have restrictions like right, that? Right. But do I hope that it will improve? I sure do. You know, we all do, I believe. And as the indicators are that uh, these kind of things are going to be improved as we go forward. Yeah. Well, and, and, but I think one of the things we've been talking about both on air and off air, and that is the power of the federal government. I mean, it's truly, it's, it's a very serious thing. And, uh, and Michelle, we've learned recently here that there are some efforts that possibly our privacy may not be as private as we'd like to think. There's been talk that cell phones, emails, et cetera, are being monitored very carefully. At the same time, we had Hillary Clinton absolutely recklessly dealing with her email per server, etc. This is such a dichotomy in this world in, in America. I mean, it you've is. got the far extremes here. We do, and part of it is with the federal government or state governments, and another part really is with uh, private industry. If you look at Facebook and Google yes. and just our credit card data being hacked into, yeah. our government has been hacked into. The CIA, yeah. social security uh, departments have been hacked into. So I think that it's safe to say that we're we're living in a day and age where it is a great dichotomy, where we have the death of privacy on one hand because of digital invasion mm -hmm. into our lives, but on the other hand, we have some of the greatest security restrictions we've ever seen, and it really ultimately comes down to personal integrity and character, and whether or not people who are given positions of great authority and power in our government are willing to act within the constraints of their positions. But you were saying here off air a little bit about the possible hacking with Donald Trump, etc. You were very passionate about that, uh, really passionate about, um, about that incident. Talk to us a little bit about your feelings. We were told very clearly, beginning at the end of the election by Hillary Clinton, yeah. she and the media were suggesting, more than suggesting, that Donald Trump was colluding with the president of Russia, Putin, and Russian authorities to throw the American election, not by actual votes at actual mm -hmm. ballot boxes, but by the Russians hacking into American ballot boxes and changing the election. There's absolutely zero, zero evidence of that. And Democrats now even have admitted that. And yet this false message was repeated right. so many times for months and months and months in the American media that it was a propaganda cudgel to make the American people think that was true. Then Donald Trump came out, if some people remember, and he said, look, I've been surveilled by the federal government. And it actually came out that the Obama administration applied for what's called FISA court warrants. The Obama administration, now listen to this, this is huge. The Obama administration actually surveilled Mr. Trump's, in the Trump Tower, his server so that the entire campaign was run through the Trump Tower, through that server. So the sitting administration that's on the opposite side of the political aisle, Democrats, were hacking into the Republicans' server to get information at the end of the campaign. And then we know that information was then released into the public from a surveillance 
This is unbelievable what happened. It is like a thousand times worse than anything that happened in Watergate. And yet the complicit media Mm -hmm. is so in bed with Obama and Jared that it doesn't matter that a sitting president of the United States and the administration surveilled the presidential candidate on the other side of the aisle, most people don't even know what happened. And yet it's out there, and we know that it's true. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. This is part two of a two-part series with my in-studio guests, Michelle Bachman and Phil Haney. And I do want to talk about Phil's book. Just have you look it up at either Amazon.com or WND.com. See something, say nothing. A Homeland Security officer exposes the government's submission to jihad. Phil Haney tried to conduct his position with Department of Homeland Security, but wasn't really allowed to. And Michelle has written the foreword to the book. You two make an excellent team, by the way. I, I want to, in the interest of time, I want to move on here to something that, Michelle, you really can speak into, and that is health care. And I recall the fact that you ran for president in 2012 with one, with many things in mind, but one of them was to get rid of Obamacare. Now we're in the process of hopefully ridding America of socialized medicine, but you've got some insights into it, and that is we're kind of being offered almost the same thing, Ryan Care, et cetera, and some of this has to do, as you were explaining earlier, with the influence of the lobbyists, et cetera. Talk to us a little bit. People have heard of that phrase, follow the money, yep. and when Obamacare was first put into effect, the first people that were on board with it were the insurance companies, Mm -hmm. were the big pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, the nursing association, the doctors association, not doctors themselves, but these big establishment entities. Why is that? It's because various industries use government for two purposes. One is they want government to carve out a monopoly for their particular business so that they'll benefit. And they also want government to punish their competitors, to put them out of business, if you will. And so, Obamacare was essentially favoring a couple of insurance companies, a couple of big pharmaceutical companies. And so those companies were fine with that. They thought this was wonderful. So now the Republicans came along and they said, we want to get rid of Obamacare, which is essentially socialized medicine. And so here we are with this bizarre bill Mm. that the Republicans came forward with, which keeps a lot of the Obamacare system. Well, why would they do that? All you have to do is look at the money. The big pharmaceutical it's called Big Pharma, has given over $5 million to a political action committee that would go ahead and advocate for Republican causes and Republican candidates. And you have to look at the money. Big Pharma supported Hillary Clinton in 2016. They gave not one red cent to Donald Trump. Donald Trump, again, is not a policy guy, but he wants to get rid of Obamacare. He also wants to have a system where everybody can be covered. So what we're seeing right now is a mess in Washington, D.C., and a mess that doesn't make sense to a lot of people because you have the very people who said they want to repeal Obamacare instead looking like they're being bought and paid for by the same industry that got behind Barack Obama. So really, here's the answer. The answer is you actually do repeal Obamacare. Mm -hmm. Simple to do. You repeal it. The second thing you do is you grant freedom to every American Mm -hmm. and you let every American in every state buy any health insurance product they want to. Today, you can't do that by law because there's restrictions. You let any American buy any health insurance product you want and you have no minimum federal requirements. Bingo. I also would encourage states to give a liability shield and protection to anybody who wants to set up a free medical clinic. Maybe doctors or nurses want to donate their time in a free clinic or pharmaceutical companies or medical device companies want to donate free products to people who truly can't afford health care. If we had a liability shield so the people who went into that clinic couldn't sue the clinic and they could just receive the free care, you'd see a lot of people doing a lot of free things. Because remember, in America and across the world, hospitals were started by Christians and by Jews. And so whether it's hospitals or clinics or good service organizations or health care for the blind or the 
lame or the deaf. So much of it was started by Christians. The Mayo Clinic was started by Catholic nuns working with the Mayo brothers mm-hmm. to bring about the finest health care in the world. I can attest from that from personal experience. It's the finest health care I've ever seen. But that was based upon a Christian motivation. If we allowed a liability shield, I truly believe every American in this country would have access to health care, but we have to get government out of the equation. Government has made health care impossibly expensive and even more impossible to access. Well, it was one of the primary issues Donald Trump campaigned on. Immigration, health care, there were three or four issues that projected him to victory. And, you know, I noted since he's been president here for just a few months now, that it's not just those on the left pushing back. And we talked heavily about that in program number one a week ago, how the left pushes back, organizing for action, etc. You've got the right pushing back on Donald Trump as well. Well, yeah, because Donald Trump made a promise. He made a promise that he was going to repeal Obamacare. And this dog's dish that is being pushed up to us, and we're told this is repeal of Obamacare, and everybody knows it isn't repeal of Obamacare, this is a disaster. You only get one little opening of the window because I was there from the from before Obamacare was put into effect yeah. until after and I was told over and over by the Republican establishment well you know we can't do anything about this because yeah. the Republicans don't control the house then we were told well we can't do anything about it the Republicans don't control the Senate then they did then we were told well we can't do anything about it because we don't have the White House now Republicans control everything and what do they do they serve up this dog dish bill that continues Obama Obamacare. It's like, what? Yeah. Do you honestly think we're that stupid well, the American that we're going to go along with this? American people are confused. Oh, they're mad. They don't, they don't, we don't know what to believe because we hear two and three exactly. sides of the story and the American people are angry, confused, bewildered. Who do we believe? Everybody's well, presenting and, and it and here's the point. in good we, faith. We tell the truth. Yeah. And the truth is we don't want the government to run no, our health care. We, we want to make our own decisions. And the best way for us to do it is to get government out of the business Mm -hmm. and let me have my transaction directly with my insurance company or my doctor and just get government out of this thing because government makes everything complicated, impossible, and expensive. Well, where do you think it's going? I actually think that if people are strong about this with their representative, that we can get a true Obamacare repeal bill Mm -hmm. and send this issue back to the states. That's where it needs to be resolved. And let the states decide what they want to do with health care in their own state. But let normal people Mm -hmm. buy the health insurance plan they want and pick their own doctor and pick their own health care and pick what is going to work for them. That's what we need, freedom. Well, we had that for a lot of years. And And it works. And 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 it gave us the the finest health care in the world. Absolutely. And we can have that again and we can hold on to it if we can get government out of the equation. So Donald Trump, again, who does not have a policy background, Mm -hmm. if he will just do what he said he was going to do, repeal Obamacare, and let the states Mm -hmm. figure out 50 different laboratories, let each state figure out how they want to offer health care in their own state, and then let every American buy any health insurance product they want anywhere in the United States with no federal intervention. Well, here's where I'd like to go, and we're going to do this here in our our next segment, and that is, and, and we've talked here off air about it, back on November 8th, 2016, God gave America a reprieve, a reprieve from, I would call it the sin agenda, hardcore leftist, socialist, godless sin agenda. And we got a reprieve. And I want to talk about that a little bit. And Michelle, you have a fascinating story because you were actually in a kind of a prayer circle that particular night, election night. Phil was doing something interesting election night. I want to talk about these things because when we look at the whole political agenda. And we talked about globalism last week, the one world agenda, bringing the Tower of Babel back. You know, we got to focus on the positive at the same time, or people just go away with their head hanging down. And we don't want them to do that. We talk about the reprieve that we got on November. Now, some of you may think it wasn't a reprieve. We're going to present it from our position anyway. Don't go away. Don't touch your dial. As Jan has already mentioned, If you'd like to have your own audio copy of today's edition of Understanding the Times, you might want part one of this series as well. We think this current series is so informative, you want to pass it along to family and friends. You can place your order for the entire series when you phone 763-559-4444. 
Again, the number, 763-559-4444. Don't forget, all our programs are archived at olivetreeviews.org every weekend following the broadcast. Week after week, we bring you cutting-edge information and insights into the times in which we live. We hope we are an inspiration to you. We invite you to help us continue to bring this kind of programming your way. Please consider becoming our financial partner. You can help ensure that we stay on the air in your neighborhood. Please send your tax-deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. You can also give securely online at olivetreeviews.org. Coming up, more conversation with Michelle Bachman and Phil Haney right after this. It's not too early to make plans to attend Understanding the Times 2017, Saturday, October 7, just outside of Minneapolis. Join us at Grace Church in Eden Prairie from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. There's no cost or registration needed. You can spend the day with like-minded believers who don't think it's strange that you want to understand the times and also discern the times of Bible prophecy. Speakers include Amir Sarfati. Our book, the Bible, contains 29% future events. 29% of this book is Bible prophecy. God wants us to know even the future. Dr. Mark Hitchcock. So I I don't believe in we should scoff at signs. I don't believe we should be reckless speculators, but I do believe uh, that signs of the times are important and that we live in a time today when the stage is being set. Pastor J.D. Farag from Calvary Chapel, Kaneohe, Hawaii. Jerusalem, as Joel Rosenberg calls it, is the epicenter. It is the, the second hand on God's prophetic clock. You want to know what time it is in terms of Bible prophecy? Look at Jerusalem. Michelle Bachman. Jesus Christ is coming back. We, in our lifetimes, potentially could see Jesus Christ returning to earth, the rapture of the church. This is one of the most exciting times in history. We need to be exactly watching the tenor of the times, be observing, and look up our redemption draw off night. Hotel information is posted at our website, olivetreeviews.org or call us for complete details at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. We have promised that we'll keep talking about today, but always with an eye on tomorrow and the hope of His return. Now, I told you from the beginning to strap in that it would be a revolution. Indeed, it was. Tonight, the voice of you. We owe a debt of gratitude to you, the American people. It's now finally been heard. It's very loud. It's very clear. And at this very moment, because of all of you speaking so loudly, Washington, D.C., the establishment is terrified, and they should be. Understanding the Times Radio continues, but first, a quick reminder. You can come hear Michelle Bachman in person on October 7. Michelle will be one of our featured speakers at our next Understanding the Times conference this fall in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Let's return now to today's guests, Michelle Bachman and Phil Haney. Once again, Jan Markell. Don't forget this programming is posted to my website every Saturday. If you aren't going to be near a radio, tune in to olivetreeviews.org and just go to the radio tab. You'll find about five years of programming there. You can get a CD. I recommend you get a CD of last week and this week. Hand them out to friends who simply don't have the connections to have the kind of information that's being given by my two guests. They include Michelle Bachman. She served Minnesota's 6th District for about eight years. And Phil Haney. Phil has a fascinating, fascinating story. I teased in the last program that we want to spend some time talking about the reprieve America got back on November the 8th. Both of you have fascinating stories. And Phil, you were in the heartland that night, Mm -hmm. November 8th. Talk to me about that. I was in Omaha, Nebraska, by choice. 
I wanted to be in the heart of America on the night of the election, whichever way it was going to go, because I had observed for uh, several months going what I felt was the tide turning toward uh, President Trump. And I thought the best place to be would be in the heart of America. And I was right. It was a great place to be because I was scheduled to speak before a large group of Republican women and their husbands and what a crowd it was and what an opportunity it was to share in this spectacular victory. Because, uh, as I mentioned earlier about the uh, Star Spangled Banner and the question of what flag would be flying in the morning, well, we were all rejoicing that it was the, the red, white, and blue. And I saw hope, as I mentioned earlier as well. So it was a great honor and a privilege to see this part of American history, especially in contrast to what I had seen as an active law enforcement mm -hmm. officer and the destructive nature of the policies that we were forced to comply with. So I, it was a really a privilege to observe that part of the emerging policies that the Obama administration sent down the chain of command and then to have the opportunity kind of on a civilian side to see the emergence of the groundswell across the country. And I was so gratified to see that what I felt I was observing was actually in fact true. Mm. It wasn't just my hopeful imagination that I was seeing across the country. It really did happen. It was like beholding a form of, let's call it a political miracle. To me, the election was like a combination of Passover, a great deliverance, and the re-declaration of independence, you know, combined together, a moment of great deliverance, because I really want us to all realize, not only as we look ahead, at what we hope will happen in the months and years ahead, but also to comprehend what we were delivered from. Yeah. Well, as I said, it, it, Michelle, it was a terrible sin agenda that was going on. I mean, when you have the White House lit with the colors of the gay rainbow, that, that was June 2015. I think that was a low point for a lot of people. And it just seemed like every perversion, including this transgender obsession, was just being celebrated. I think God said enough. Well, and I think the American people said enough. And, and I think they right. recognized this was the last exit ramp for the country. Mm -hmm. And if we were not going to see a political change, if Hillary Clinton was going to continue and double down on the policies of Barack Obama, I think people just saw no hope that the United States would return to a position of Judeo-Christian morality. But not even just that, it's just, can we even be able to speak truth mm -hmm. anymore? That's right. Can we even protect our children anymore? Because we were in a situation where the President of the United States, on his own, just issued a sheet of paper and said overnight every single public school in the country would have to have the girls bathrooms open to the boys and the boys bathrooms open to the girls and the girls shower rooms would be open and accessible to the boys because now what we were told from the White House is that when we look at our body in a shower our body isn't reality no, anymore not reality so we actually get to choose if we're a boy if we're a girl if we're one of like 58 different whatevers right. that we decide we want to be that day. In other words, we were all told that we were forced to repeat a lie, not the truth. We didn't even have the choice that we could repeat the truth anymore. We were all told that we were going to be enforced by the power of the federal government to repeat lies. And when you repeat lies, Romans 1 tells yeah. us, that's when you fall into deception. God gives us over to our own delusion. Yeah. And so people have been in this very confusing period of what are we allowed to say? Is it okay to say this? Can, do I, can I not say that? And so people have been quiet and they have restricted, they've censored their own speech because they didn't know what the government was going to do to them. Meanwhile, their little five-year-old girl could be vulnerable to a 17-year-old male walking in on their bathroom, or my 85-year-old mother could be at a public restroom and seven 18-year-old males could come in and she could be vulnerable to them. Well, things have happened that aren't very Absolutely pleasant. They, they have, have happened. Yes. Absolutely they have. And people said, enough already. Yes. And so we were given a reprieve. Again, it isn't that politics is our God. It isn't that politics is necessarily the answer. But God has privileged us in this country that we get to be able to vote for the laws and the people that we live under. And so people decided to take that vote. It was completely improbable. I know it was reprieved. That night I was privileged in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. to be with David Barton from Wall Builders Ministries. And we were doing commentary that night on Daystar TV and, and various other yeah. Christian channels. I saw you. It was excellent. 
Helen. It was unbelievable because we had intercessors there yeah. at the studio, and there are intercessors all over the United States that have been all crying the out world. to God all, all over, over the, world. the world. And in the green room that night, there was a TV, and it was focused on believers in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And I had never, I walked into that green room, and I said, who are those people? I thought maybe they were right there in Dallas. And they said, that's Jerusalem. That's believers in Jerusalem who are beseeching God for the American election tonight. And I had electricity go up and down my spine because I thought if we have believers across the world humbling themselves and crying out to holy God for deliverance for this country, we've got a chance. Now, unlike Phil, I woke up that morning and I thought, I don't know if Trump is going to win. I don't know what's going to happen because I had been campaigning across the country for, yes. for Trump. And I saw great things happening in high Democrat voter registration areas where you had very high numbers of Democrats that were going to vote for Donald Trump. But, you know, in this world, usually, like I had said earlier, for over 50 years, we've lost like Mm -hmm. every battle. You know, those on the Judeo-Christian traditional value side, we just lose like Mm -hmm. almost everything all the time. And the left has been winning for over 50 years. So I thought, you know, the odds were completely against Trump's favor. It's kind of like the Super Bowl victory that we just saw happen. Just like Israel has won the last four games in the yeah. in the baseball competition. They nobody, you know, they had, they were like 401 to win anything. Just impossible odds. And yet we saw this happen and that's why I think we're so excited because we know that this wasn't just in the natural. This was in the supernatural yeah. where God sovereignly, I believe, answered the prayers of believers beseeching him and he's given us a reprieve. But a reprieve for what? Yeah. For what? What are we going to do with this? Because remember, over 50 years of destruction destroying the foundations of this country. You you don't just turn that on a dime unless God again intervenes. And that's where I think as believers, it wasn't just the election that we were to be in prayer about. It's today that we're to be in prayer about so that our personal lives are changed by the gospel and so that our families and our churches and and what we touch and our prayer life needs to be focused on turning ourselves toward God. Because let's face it, the world is spinning out of control. The world has not turned away from evil or from rebellion or from the Tower of Babel and erecting a Tower of Babel in our day. And so what we need to be about is his business and cry out to him for our families, for our nation, for our president, for his cabinet. We need to cry out because Donald Trump, God bless him, I wouldn't want to be him. He's in a very difficult situation. And we need a sovereign God to have his hand on his shoulder and to speak into this day that we live into. Well, he has some fairly solid Christians serving by his side. In Very his, solid. In, in I can cabinet. attest. I can yeah. attest Mike Pence, the yeah. vice president of the United States. I was a colleague with Mike Pence. He and I were both members of the mm-hmm. House of Representatives. He's a very strong believer. He's very pro-life. Yeah. He's genuine in his faith. And there are other believers as well. Tom Price, who yes. is the head of yes. Health and Human Services. I was in Israel with Dr. Tom Price when his wife, Betty, was baptized. And these are very strong believers. I was in Bible studies in Washington, Mm -hmm. D.C., and Dr. Price is in Bible studies today, along with other members of the cabinet. I know, for instance, Betsy DeVos, the education Mm -hmm. secretary. I serve on the Family Research Council board with her mother, Elsa Prince, who's a very strong believer. These are people who are committed in their faith. This, too, is a reprieve because previous administration... You've got hardcore leftist, Marxist, atheists, humanists, and what a turnaround. I mean, it's truly a miracle. It truly is a un- miracle. unbelievable miracle. We haven't mm-hmm. seen an administration like this with no. this quality and this level of people for a very long period of time. We're in a unique period of history. So the last thing believers should do is go to sleep and Amen. sit back and criticize. What we need to do, I mean, just imagine, after four years of this administration, the question will be, what did we do? What did we do as believers? Did we pray? Did we fast? Did we speak? speak out. What did we do? Because I think that if we see the miracle working hand of Mm -hmm. God that gave us this reprieve continue to work for the next four years, and we are seeking the Lord during that process, we could see potentially a fundamental shift in this country and the gospel continue to go forth. Or if we just shrink back and go to sleep and think about ourselves and look at the selfishness and just focus on the evil in our day, as opposed to the power of a miracle working God to change things in our midst and trust him for his majestic power, 
we could see great things happen. Just like in the first yeah. century, the first 12 disciples saw the impossible happen because a majestic God performed miracles mm. in their midst. Satan is angry. Amen. Satan is angry. You and I, all of us have seen online one story after another after another about assassination thoughts towards Donald it's Trump. It's insane. I, in the I've movies never and seen TV, anything like this. On tweets out there yeah. where you have like Snoop Dogg. Yeah. You probably saw that Absolutely. where he had a parody supposedly mm -hmm. and he had a gun pointed at Donald Trump's head. Yeah. I mean, who does this? Well, who does this? Satan is angry. Phil, you have a thought on this? Going back to what Michelle was talking yeah. about being involved, it brought to mind the parable of the unjust steward where the Lord gave a group of people a gift and they came back at a certain time to report on what they had done with this talent, this money that they had mm -hmm. been given. And the unjust steward said, I didn't do anything with it. I just poured it in the ground because I figured there's no way I could please you anyway. And uh, the Lord said, depart from me, you mm -hmm. worker of iniquity. We have been given gifts and abilities, and they're intended for us to use where we are at this point in our life, wherever that may be. And God forbid that we should stand before him and he asks us, what did you do back there in 2017 yeah. when, you were, when you were an American citizen? Well, I did this and I joined that group and I got in this discussion and I went out and did this and I supported that person and I encouraged my family and my friends and my community. Or, well, no, I didn't really do anything. I w there was a lion in the street. I was afraid to go out and I just hid in my home. That will not be acceptable on that great day. Michelle, when you were campaigning as you were the fall of 2016, then did you pick up the sense from the people, common people, who were being so overlooked by those in Washington that they sensed that there was something new on the horizon? Somebody was listening to them? Absolutely. There's no question. People were scared. You yeah. could see it on people's faces. It was a very real fear that people had that we were going to lose this great gift that we had been mm -hmm. given in this country, and it's particularly among believers. Yes. Believers yes. got it. Believers Believers and did. Believers and got And they it. made the difference in the polls. They totally made the difference. If you look at the data, don't believe me. If you look at all of the polling data, it shows that believers stayed home in droves in 2012. 2012. They just felt like they weren't going to make a difference. They mm -hmm. looked at the Republican nominee, Mitt Romney, and they didn't see that this was a vital election, that, the, that mm -hmm. they could make a difference. They saw the compare and contrast between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And Donald Trump was far from an ideal candidate. Absolutely. In, in almost every way, right. there were very real concerns that Christians had about this guy. But they looked at Hillary Clinton and they knew exactly what they were going to get in Hillary Clinton. She had a lifetime yeah. of corruption that you can't just sweep under the rug. And she had put the United States at risk in that. Yeah. I can just say from my own experience, when she had an unsecured yeah. server as Secretary of State in her basement that was easily hackable by yeah. every enemy America has, what she did is put every most sensitive classified secret of the United States in the hands hands of our enemies in real time over four years. I don't know any American official that has ever betrayed our country in the way that Hillary Clinton betrayed our country. That was obvious for everyone to see in these final months of the campaign. And people said, how could we knowingly yeah. allow her to be president of the United States when she's already failed the test over and Absolutely. over and over already again failed. as commander in chief? Just Benghazi alone yeah. showed that she failed the test as commander in chief. So even though with all of his obvious flaws, Donald Trump was a far more mm -hmm. obvious choice because what did he stand for? He wanted to secure America's borders yeah. and he was willing to say, we've got rapists and murderers and we've got people who will actually rape children coming across our border. All? No. But enough that we need to stop this. And he also named the enemy as radical Islam, meaning there's a problem here mm -hmm. with people coming from Islamic countries who want to harm us. And he wanted to stop that. He named these enemies that were yeah. praying upon America and he said, I'm going to do something about it. 
it. And people believed him. He was a tough well, guy. He's not an ideologue. He doesn't care about political, practic- correct, political yeah. correctness, could care less. Yeah. What yeah. I observed is the concept of redemption. Even in judgment, the Lord makes plain that his intention is redemption and reconciliation. And I have a little joke about Donald Trump. If people thought he was either a nitwit or a misfit, and they didn't like everything about him, I'd like to remind believers especially that the Lord specializes in nitwits mm. and misfits. I mean, look at the people in the Bible and the dysfunction that he worked through despite all the flaws of character that people had. What are we looking for? A perfect person or someone who will grow into the, by the grace of God into a position? When I'd also like to add that I've known Donald Trump yes. personally for five years. This guy is not a nitwit. This guy is not a dimwit. He's an extremely mm-hmm. bright individual. And when you think about it, this guy conquered the real estate industry in New York City, and he turned a million dollars into multi-billions of dollars. You don't just do that. If it was easy, we'd all be billionaires. He did something very difficult. He conquered that industry. Then he went into entertainment. He conquered the entertainment industry with this number one show. Then he went for a third career into politics, Mm -hmm. and he runs for president against 17 very good competitors, including a lot of really strong believers. I knew all the people who were running for president. And Donald Trump was number one from the day he went into the election, and he went on to not only defeat all of his... His Republican competitors, but Hillary Clinton and the Clinton machine. I mean, this is yeah, unbelievable yeah. what happened. Well, again, it was a sovereign act of God. Here's where I want to go in our closing segment, and it is a short one, but it's an important topic we haven't hit yet. And folks, we've hit a lot of topics in the last two weeks. If you missed last weekend, catch it online, olivetreeviews.org, go to radio, get some CDs of the programming. All programming is posted to my website on uh, Saturday morning. But where I want to go in the closing segment is a little bit kind of your specialty, but really both of you. The foreign policy, and particularly the new day it is with Israel, our number one ally, and how marginalized she was for eight years. And then we saw way back on February 15th, Netanyahu and President Trump meet, and you could see the body language of Benjamin Netanyahu was, thank God it's over. The eight years is over, and I'm free. It was an amazing day that day, February 15th. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, where we're going on some other foreign policy issues, too. My goodness, Europe is collapsing. Middle East is just a mess. Donald Trump is not necessarily a foreign policy expert. What's going to happen? We'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes, folks. Don't go away. We know you're enjoying today's discussion on Understanding the Times. Remember, this is the second of a two-part series. You can order your own audio copies of these two programs. We recommend you request both parts of the series. Place your order by phoning 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. You can access all our resources, including all broadcast programming, online at olivetreeviews.org. You can participate in this listener-supported ministry. Tax-deductible gifts are accepted at Olive Tree Ministries, Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. In just a moment, we'll conclude today's program. Please stay with us. This program has tried to provide a voice for the remnant believers for almost 16 years began on one station in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, but quickly expanded as those who wanted the truth of our times were across the country. We can't thank you enough for being a part of our team with your giving and your prayer support. The Olive Tree family has grown beyond all our expectations. To keep this message alive in your neighborhood, would you consider a tax-deductible gift to Olive Tree Ministries in 2017? Just write Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Or find our donate page online at olivetreeviews.org. You can always call us at 763-559-4444, 763-559-4444. Remember, we keep an eye on today's headlines, but we also look at what the Bible says about tomorrow and the hope of His return. 
This is Jan Markell. Many Christian leaders avoid the topics of our day, but here on this program, we hit them head on. The times demand we address the hard issues and bring a biblical viewpoint into focus. Thanks for joining us. Now, let's wrap up our discussion on today's Understanding the Times. Here's Jan Markell. And welcome back. Remember, I try to stay in touch with you through our Facebook, Jan Markell's Olive Tree Ministries, print newsletter, e-newsletter. You can become a CD subscriber. Just give my office a call, get a CD of every program. And we encourage you to get a couple of CDs of this two-part series and hand them out to friends who just don't have access to the information. And we've got a short segment here, and I want to touch on some important issues yet. And Michelle, you've traveled to the capitals of the world as a representative, as a running for president of the United States, and we're both so overjoyed to see a new relationship with God's covenant land and people, which you and I have been there many, many times. Tell me your thoughts as you saw, particularly way back on February 15th, Benjamin Netanyahu and President Trump. This is one of the best stories of the election, one of the very Mm -hmm. best outcomes. I traveled to Israel after the election in the end of November and the beginning of December in 2016, and you could see the elation and how overjoyed people were across Israel at the outcome of the American election with the election of Donald Trump, because everyone knew Barack Obama was against Israel. Mm -hmm. It was obvious. obvious. All you had to do is see that every policy had was to cut the legs out from under Israel and to advance the interests of Islamic Jihad. In fact, I believe that Barack Obama's number one foreign policy purpose was to lift up Iran and to ensure that they would become a nuclear power and a party to contend with in the nations of the world. This was Israel's greatest concern and greatest fear, and yet the right hand of a holy God had Israel's back. And in his provision, in his time, he raised up Donald Trump, who is a pro-Israel president whose daughter married a Jewish Mm -hmm. man and and keeps a kosher home. But I think more importantly, Donald Trump has no anti-Israel agenda. He is not out to settle a score with Israel. It was palpable. You could see that with Barack Obama, that he had an inner hatred. That's a harsh word. I hate to use it, but almost a visceral anger toward the Jewish state. Now, the other thing that's very good, I believe, is the ambassador that Donald Trump chose. Yes. And that is Mr. Friedman, who is our ambassador going to Israel. Mr. Friedman is an excellent choice and an excellent candidate because he has a history Mm -hmm. of being a pro-Zionist for Israel. This isn't just something convenient. This isn't a business proposition. He genuinely is for Israel. He's for the United States, but he is for the Jewish people and for the Jewish nation. So the United States has abandoned its posture under Obama of being against Israel and doing everything it could to hurt Israel. And now instead, you want to talk about a reprieve. This is the greatest thing that could have happened. Now the United States is for Israel. That puts us in the path of blessing. Absolutely. And we were talking about that off air here. And Phil, you and I cited Genesis 12, 3. America's going to be blessed as a result of this. Well, we're seeing the Bible come alive in, in our own time. The promise is immutable, eternal. The Lord made an everlasting covenant mm-hmm. with the land and the people of Israel and those who would come alongside. We are heirs of the promises of God. And if we see the reality of the everlasting covenant, we will be eternally blessed. If Donald Trump aligns himself as a friend of Israel, by God's promise, he will bless us in many ways that we can't even imagine. Absolutely. It may give us the motivation to get the other part parts of our house in order. If we have that right, everything else has potential for coming into a place. If we have that wrong, after all, what does the verse say? He that blesses Israel will be blessed, yeah. Genesis and 12, he that 3. curses Israel will be cursed. And that brings up another intriguing thing. What are some of the possible consequences for these anti-Israel policies that people like Barack Obama put in place? The Lord doesn't just look away and forget about it just because he's not president anymore. I was kind of going there 
And, Michelle, we have the Iran Treaty Agreement. ISIS formed under Barack Obama. The UN Security Council back on December 23rd. We have some staggering things, negatively speaking, they that really took are. place under really that, in that administration. Staggering. They are. But we also have an opportunity mm-hmm. with a new sheriff in town yeah. to send a signal to the world that the United States is not going to be a patsy to advance the Islamic agenda anymore. That's right. And that sends a powerful signal. What is tragic is that Barack Obama already has put $150 billion into the hands hands of the leading killer in the world today. The chief state sponsor of terrorism, the Ayatollah Khomeini, has $150 billion. What's worth over a 10 years period, he has a trillion dollars worth of business deals with the likes of North Korea, China, Russia, and all the rest that he'll be contending with. We need to do everything that we can to make sure that Iran is no longer empowered and that their their interests and their gold, which is well stated. Remember, during this whole Iran agreement, I was at actually at a press conference with Donald Trump and Ted Cruz. It was sponsored by Ted Cruz at the Capitol on the Iran agreement. And the Ayatollah Khomeini had just written a book that Iran will annihilate Israel within 25 25 years. years. They're very overt about their goals. They aren't right now because with Barack Obama, they they could every day of the week say death to Israel, death yeah. to the United States. You don't see that anymore, do you? The reason why is because Iranians are smart enough to know we're not going to put our thumb in the eye of an American president who opposes what it is that they want to do. But the United States needs to do everything that we can. There is no agreement. First of all, I want to make it clear. There's no there agreement. Is, there is, is no Iran you're agreement. Right. All Barack Obama did is just enrich Iran. Yeah. And so we can't do anything about that. That is that that horse has left the barn. But what we can do is make sure that Iran gets no further advantages and take every opportunity that we can to rest that monster that's in the process of being created. And I still believe, as I said to Barack Obama personally, yeah. as I said to Prime Minister Netanyahu personally, the United States of America, in my opinion, should work with Israel and every other ally that we can, and we should bomb and take out the known nuclear facilities that we are aware of in Mm -hmm. Iran, because they will be used by them, not only to annihilate Israel, but to annihilate us. And we have to recognize this is their plan. It's not just aspirational. They intend to do this, and we need to defang this enemy before it's able to claw us. Encourage you to come on out this fall, October the 7th, Saturday, October the 7th, Grace Church, Eden Prairie, Minnesota, just outside Minneapolis. Meet Michelle Bachman. My other speaker is Amir Sarfati from Israel. Pastor J.D. Farag, Calvary Chapel, Kaneohe, Hawaii. Dr. Mark Hitchcock, yours truly, and lots of others will be there. Encourage you to check it out, olivetreeviews.org. Just go to conferences or give my office a call, and we can send you out all the information that is needed, including hotel information. And Phil Haney, again, your incredible book, See Something, Say Nothing, A Homeland Security Officer Exposes the Government's Submission to Jihad. Folks, only a couple places to get this is at WorldNetDaily, WND.com or Amazon.com. You say this is still an active story. Yeah, there are five threads woven through this book, yeah. five different, we'll call them, cases. One of them was the Tablighi Jamaat case that I worked on at the National Targeting Center. That and that they, had to tie in with uh, San Bernardino and, and, Orlando, and Orlando as well. Yeah. Another one is a major emphasis on the M- Muslim Brotherhood. Mm-hmm. Those records were purged out of the law enforcement database. The records on the Tablighi Jamaat, Orlando, and San Bernardino yeah. case were purged out. And those things are still going on to this very day. Mm-hmm. I'm still getting information through the Freedom of Information Act that is making is proving what I have been saying all along and not merely proving it but making the actual story stronger as we go day by day and I hope in the days and weeks ahead I'll be able to get that story out more but it's a live story well you're speaking across the country mm-hmm. I think you're just traveling from one state to another aren't you just doing lots of meetings updating folks mm-hmm. on these kinds of issues in a funny way I'm doing what I hope I would be able to do in the Trump administration mm-hmm. when I I actually get deputized. I'm not waiting to be told what to do. Mm-hmm. I learned that from my dad who grew up in Iowa. Don't wait for somebody to tell you what to do. Yeah. If you 
see it, just go do it. Mm-hmm. And so basically I'm doing a version of what I hope to do when I'm back in active duty in the federal government as work at a grassroots level to help President Trump address some of the negative effects yes. of the policies that were implemented across the country, you know, from my perspective as a law enforcement officer. Well, you haven't retired, in other words. Not really. I am, but I'm not. I'm still active yeah. duty, especially since I took the vow to help protect the country, and also especially since I've gotten new information from the FOIA process that makes it incumbent upon me to stay active. I have to see this thing through because if we can resolve the issues and the policies that led to San Bernardino and Orlando and the Boston Boston Boston. Marathon, Mm -hmm. then you're going to unravel the whole problem because if we don't solve, address these policies that led to these attacks, I can safely say that we may not be able to disarm the problem. But if we do effectively address it, then we're going to go a really long ways toward preventing future attacks like that. And can I just add, we need to at least stop letting known terrorists yes. into our country. We just saw the death of the blind sheik. Yes. And the blind sheik was a known terrorist, and yet we yeah. let him into this country. He's not the only one. Yeah. We need to stop issuing waivers to known terrorists, and we need to stop letting these people in the country open up our eyes and recognize there's bad people with bad agendas for this country. And we need to think about self-preservation and at least least keep the bad guys out. Mm. I want to thank you both for coming in to the studio for these uh, two programs. Again, folks, I encourage you to get a couple of CDs and just hand them out. You know, get uh, five sets of CDs, hand them out to folks who need this information. Perhaps they don't have access to whatever computer. They just don't know this kind of information. I just want to close. And again, thank you both for coming in. And Phil, you're driving across country, and I'm so glad you could stop by today. Michelle lives here in the Twin City area. Let me just close with a saying. I like to use every now and then and that is and we've talked about troubled times today and we just really need to look back and thank him to look around and serve him to look ahead and trust him but folks always look up and expect him he's coming again sooner rather than later we'll talk to you next week Thank you for joining us for today's Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. We continue to reach the world by reporting current events from a biblical perspective. Costing us thousands of dollars, this listener-supported program is delivered each weekend nationwide and into your home. You can help us produce and distribute this broadcast. We invite you to partner with this ministry. With our ever-changing world, men and women of faith need to be aware of current events as reported and discussed through the lens of Scripture. With the blessed hope in view, each week, Jan Markell brings you compelling guest interviews to highlight the dangers in today's world. To become our broadcast partner, please write with your tax-deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. You can also help underwrite this program safely and securely at olivetreeviews.org or when you phone 763-559-4444. We're looking forward to hearing from you this week, and please continue to pray for the Olive Tree Ministries team for daily global updates with a biblical worldview 24 hours a day. Log on to olivetreeviews.org. Next week, Jan returns with another program designed to help you understand the times. Jesus.